They should be the most innocent members of society, but children can be capable of the most horrific, premeditated and violent murders. I thought they are so sadistic what they do to my son. Evil, just pure evil. What drives these children to kill strangers, their family, even their closest friends? I have completely blocked him out of my life. I've pretended like he has died along with Ellie. With access to police officers and their evidence. Charging a 16-year-old with, with, with murder is heartbreaking um, because, because they are children, they are kids. And the insight of a leading criminologist. When you render your victim less human, it's much easier for you to be able to attack and kill them. We ask if they're victims of their environment, or are they born evil? What sort of person can do that? We hear first-time testimony from the families of innocent victims. The scumbags, through and through, and I hope they have a terrible time in jail, which they should, being child killers. As they reveal the devastating impact of losing a loved one. 20 minutes, that role it's OK um, to go on. And, um, yeah, and she died in my arms. On Monday the 7th of October 2019, in Hinckley near Leicester, CCTV captured 17-year-old Dylan West leaving his house. He was on his way to confront one of his best friends, 18-year-old Josh Taylor. He called him Bonehead. I've seen it all, the videos, plenty of times, more than I've wanted to see it. I've heard his voice, the anger in his voice. I'm gonna fuck you up, Bonehead. Like most teenage boys, they often fall out. But tonight, this fight would end in tragedy. It was shocking when I learned that a 17-year-old had been accused of such an awful crime on the streets of an ordinary town. It was about power, about being in charge, who was dominant in this relationship. A witness filmed the confrontation, and another saw everything from no more than 10 feet away. One of the lads just turned round and got his fist out, and he went like that, straight into the other one's chest. It wasn't just a punch, because in Dylan West's hand was a kitchen knife. It pierced Josh's heart, and he was dead in minutes. I can't forgive. He, he killed my best friend in cold blood. There is no way that I will ever forgive him. And the only way you can make this better is if you can bring Josh back. And nobody can, so it's never going to get any better. It's never going to get any better. Never. For the family, this tragedy is twice as sickening after the killer was acquitted of murder and sentenced to just eight years for manslaughter. If it was an accident, like drugs or a car crash, or it hurt himself, people would be able to come to terms with that and accept that, but because it was a, it was a, it was no accident, this was murder, and we all know that, he's got away with it. Josh Taylor was a popular and active teenager, much loved by his friends and adored by his little sister. Yeah, we were really close. I think that's what makes it harder, because it's only one sibling. It's such a special bond. So it's like your other half is it's gone, it's missing. He was cheeky, just so cheeky, like smiling all the time. He was so nice, like most of the caring, one of the most caring people I've ever met, to be honest. I'm not saying that just because he's my brother, but he really was. Like when we were younger, he'd always watch out for me, always put his arms around me. Josh was born on the 3rd of March, 2001. From a baby, he was the best baby, you know, you could wish for. He, he slept all through, feeds brilliant. Uh, a bit fussy with his meals, but, you know, he, he, as a baby, he, he, was, he was the best baby he could wish for. Never worried. We, we noticed how good he was when Lucy came along, you see, because uh, she, she was a bit of a screamer. Lucy was just over a year younger than Josh. 
because he's the only thing I had, like, apart from my mum and dad. He was just, like, more like my best mate as well. Like, he, I felt like he was always there, you know, even though I'm more probably more spoiled than him, he'd always never see me without. So caring and kind, considerate, and he didn't have a bad brain in his body, honestly, he didn't. He was just, he was great. I couldn't wish for a better brother. Josh had a passion for anything on wheels. He'd always wanted to be a mechanic, so I think he could have made something of himself eventually, definitely. He wasn't dumb, he wasn't stupid, you know. Josh and Lucy grew up in a quiet Leicestershire village, but after their parents split up, they moved to the town of Hinckley to live with their mum. Hinckley is an ordinary town. It doesn't really have that many issues that I'm aware of. I cover the Crown Court for the whole of Leicestershire and we don't get a lot of major cases from the Hinckley area. Occasionally we do, but it doesn't seem to be a major crime area. It's an ordinary town and people just get on with their everyday lives there. It used to be um, a hosiery market town and quite an unremarkable town, really. It's not a crime hotspot. Josh had never enjoyed school, and moving to a new one only made matters worse. We both moved to the JCC school in Hinckley. I don't think we uh, liked it very well, because we were just chucked in, and it's like a big college, you know, and it's... He didn't really like it, so he left school um, just after he did his GCSEs. He didn't really like to go, so he used to skive off a lot. I thought, I've got to keep my eye on this one, because he's, he's just like me, and he... He was, he tried to be like me, and I didn't want him to be like me. I wanted to, you know, I didn't, I, I was a bit of a tear away at school and didn't do very well and come out with no qualification. I didn't want that for him. I wanted him to, you know, wanted him to knuckle down at school and, you know, get on. And... In Hinckley, Josh met other like-minded teenagers who also often skipped school. He just doesn't like authority figures and he, he just found it boring. Same as most people, do you know what I mean? They, they don't like school. It's just something we have to do. He was my best friend. He was the closest thing I had to a brother, if that makes sense. Like, he, we was inseparable. Without him, there was no me and vice versa. In the friendship group that Josh joined was 17-year-old Dylan West. I met Dylan when he was, like, 13. And it was the same again, really. We, we just clicked. We played football. And we just clipped, you know what I mean? And then he ended up being our friend. He was in the friendship group, and we all got along. West grew up in a loving home with his mum. But some that knew him thought West showed signs of being a more volatile character. I don't know how, like, how to put it. It just feels like he's been drinking all the time or like on something all the time. That's how it would be. Cause, like, and you know when he's angry as well, because his eyes would go really wide. And you'd see like anger in his eyes, and you'd, you'd think, "What's wrong with you? What, what's anyone done to you?" As I thought, he was a decent person. Do you know what I mean? As I thought, he was a good friend of mine. But obviously, what happens behind closed doors is a completely different story. He told us basically that his mum had said that lot. Like, she was thinking about kicking him out because she couldn't control him and stuff like that. So obviously, the side was there. It was just we never really thought about it. And there was evidence of a more destructive temperament that would one day end in tragedy. We had a big paddling pool up in the garden, and obviously Dylan West, he, he said he claiming he was pissed off about something. They've come into the garden through my back gate. My brother's walked into the kitchen with his other friend. And all of a sudden we can hear, my mum and Josh can hear water rushing everywhere. And my mum's looked out the window and seen a burn mark in the, the paddling pool. So he's come in the garden and set fire to my paddling pool and then ran off, just out of anger. Never ignore that part of the context that we're dealing with here is childish immaturity. Dylan West was known for engaging in sporadic acts of irrational, violent, often violent behaviour. He was showing off. Apparently he's always had this anger in him ever since he was young but what, why come into my house and, and touch things that aren't yours? And especially we'd only had the paddling pool about, about, about a week, you know? It was just a bit, you know, you can tell you're not quite wired up right if you're doing something like that. Young men perform masculinity 
in ways that are often incredibly unhelpful and incredibly violent. And that's what comes with maturity, a way of being masculine without resorting to violence. There was also volatility between Josh and Dylan West. I think Josh felt a little bit intimidated by him sometimes, you know. But then again, Dylan was jealous of Josh, you know. He, he, Josh got the, got the girls, you know, he, he was upper body strength, like I say, he was strong. You know, he could do things that he couldn't. But uh, I think Josh, because I think Josh saw him as a bit of a nutter. I think he knew he was a bit of a nutter, you know. But not dangerous enough that he's going to do something like that. So, he, you know, he thought he was mate. Teenage kicks for Josh and West's group of friends usually involve drinking and making mischief. So we had nowhere to go, really, so just get pissed in the park, cause trouble, as normal teenagers do. Um, like smash bottles and like, be loud and stuff like that. Like cause disturbances, like walking down the street or something, being loud, tipping bins over and yeah, just stupid shit. Drugs also featured heavily with the group. There were no angels. I can tell you Josh was no angel at all, you know. Um, they'd do drugs, you know. I wouldn't say it was anything really, really bad, high drugs. I know they'd smoke weed and you know, have, have beers down there, and probably have a, a bit of cocaine, if that's what they did on a weekend. Um, they were all close, though. In October 2019, an apparently normal night of drinking and drug taking would end in tragedy. The tragedy is that young men who fall out with each other need to save face. And some immature young men, or young men who are not thinking rationally, try to save face by attacking the person who they believe has disrespected them. And because of a stupid argument, I left him. And that I will always hold myself sort of responsible for what happened that night because I left him. Dylan did not like to be wrong. He didn't like to be proved wrong. He didn't like being told what to do, you know? And that's how it, it happened that night. In 2017, 16-year-old Josh Taylor moved to Hinckley, Leicestershire. He was a popular teenager. But one of the boys in his friendship group called Dylan West hid a temper that would one day boil over and Josh would pay with his life. Josh's life feels like he's had that for nothing and he's lived to the age of, what, 18? He's still a baby. He's only just beginning his life is, you know? And it's just been snatched away from him. To this group of lads, the 6th of October 2019 was just like any other. I'd message Josh in the morning, like, Sam, bro, I'm coming down, get the kettle on. And, uh, yeah, not every single day that I wasn't at work, we'd be sat here having a cup of tea in the morning. I'd wait for Josh to have a shower, and we'd go out, go and meet Dylan, go and meet Kieran, and go to the park through the day, go play football. And then I went home. Um, to go and get food and a shower. And then they, I, I didn't go back out until like 10 o'clock that night. And then uh, Josh messaged me saying, uh, I'll come out, we've got a bottle. The lads, Josh, Dylan West, Cameron, and two others had managed to be served three bottles of vodka and headed to Richmond Park near Josh's home. Richmond Park's just down the road from here. It's where they always go. They went there every single day. It's a quite a big open space, to be honest. So they just, you know, they used to have a smoke down there and a drink down there. And there's literally shops around the corner, a big football court, so they'd play football there. A big green bench that they'd sit on, you know, and just listen to music. They'd just chill out there. That's what they'd do. Because there's no place for us to go, do you know what I mean? There's no... Like, in the olden days, there used to be, like a, a, like, a disco for, like, the older generation or something like that. We don't have that, do you know what I mean? We don't, we don't have it. We, we have a youth club at the road, but it's, it's not for us taste, do you know what I mean? So where else are we going to go? Simple as that, basically. We, we go and get drunk because we have nothing else, to, nothing better to do with our time. So just like every other day, the lads headed to the park with bottles of vodka. But on this day, things would turn out differently. Lucy was with them for the first part of the evening. They've got a bottle of vodka, a bottle of lemonade, cups. So they've gone around the park, round the corner. 
We've sat there listening to music for a bit, everything's fine. So by the time we've left there, there must have been a, a drip left in the bottle. I said, it started spitting, it's gotta be about half 10 now. I said, come on Josh, you can walk me home now, cause it's only around the corner. So they've all walked me home up here to the end of my road. He says, all right Josh, love you, I'll see you later. And he said, love you, bye bye. But 10 minutes later, Josh came back home. So he's come in and chucked his jumper in the washing machine. And then he's obviously gone into the drawer and got the smallest knife out of the collection to give to them to slash in tires, cause that's what they were doing. So that's why Josh had a knife in the first place, because they were slashing tires. West was already carrying a knife, but now Josh also had one, a fact that would have devastating consequences. As he rejoined the group, Dylan West's violent side came to the surface. And then we were walking back up to the park, and uh, then Dylan has um, put a knife straight through the tire of a car. And then I've gone, I've, I've, I live like, near where he did it. So obviously I started going mad at him, saying, why are you doing that, bro? Like, I've, I've got, I live on the street. That's, I've got to walk up and down the street every day. Just trying to make us laugh and trying to show off and trying to be something he ain't, really. As most people are when they're drunk. <laughs> but in my eyes, that's, that's an idiotic move, do you know what I mean? That's, just, that's a very stupid thing to do. Like, you have to walk up and down the street as well to go to Josh's, to go to the park, do you know what I mean? So it's just stupid in my eyes. Cameron confronted West. And uh, we squared up and I had, my, I had my fist clenched, he had his fist clenched, we stepped in front of us and said, Cam, go home, it's not worth it, he's drunk, just go home. So I did. Cameron took Josh's advice and went home. My last words to Dylan was that you're a prick for doing what you did and I'm, I'm angry with you, just leave me alone. And then I turned, turned my back and walked home. The rest of the group reached the park benches and continued to drink. I know that three bottles had been purchased that evening. They had consumed a vast amount and they were larking about. The atmosphere was perfectly OK. Things took a sinister turn, however. At some stage, Dylan West had borrowed Josh's Bluetooth speaker and then Josh asked for it back, which appeared, according to the witnesses, to um, annoy Dylan West a bit. And he either threw it down or threw it towards him. And as a result, that was broken. That might seem very insignificant, but this was the key turning point in the events that evening. Josh was furious. Josh erupted angrily because beloved speaker had been broken. Dylan appeared angry and stormed off. Josh went after him and a scuffle took place. And at one point, Josh was on top of Dylan West and one of the other boys pulled him away. And that should have been the end of the matter. West ran off towards this alleyway that led to a local supermarket near his home. Josh and the others chased him to the supermarket car park, where West climbed up onto the roof of the petrol station. Do you want me to call the fire engine, boy? <laughs> oh, shit, Dylan! Oh, my oh. God, Dylan! Dylan! <laughs> and at that point, something strange happened because Josh produced a small... Um, pen knife or a small knife and said something about let's get him and one of the boys told him don't be stupid put that away West jumped and ran off as he fell he tore his jacket Josh and the others sprinted after him but West made it safely to his home just a few hundred meters away so Dylan went back home and he was there for under two minutes and he armed himself with two knives, a small one and a large one, and went back outside. When West left his house, he was caught on camera. Before moving on, he stopped and adjusted his clothing. But police believed he was doing something far more sinister. Dylan ducked down or was putting one of the knives, the smaller knife, in his sock 
at that point. A further camera in the street then captured West as he continued. And then other footage catches him storming down the street, shouting really loudly. All the neighbours will have been woken up by this. And he was shouting, come on, bonehead. I've seen it all, the videos, plenty of times. More than I've wanted to see it. I've heard his voice, the anger in his voice. I'm gonna fuck you up, Bonehead. That's what he called my brother, Bonehead. You know, I'm gonna fuck you up over and over and over again. I can hear it in my head. Even when I close my eyes at night, I can hear it. I know he meant it. He was out for blood that night, and that's what he got. West caught up with Josh and the two other friends at the end of his road. A parked up taxi driver saw what happened next. Yeah, the it was approximately 12.30ish, I think it was, 12.30, 12.40, when the lads walked past. Two of the lads were walking ahead, and I don't know what they were. They were talking loud. I don't know if they were trying to annoy neighbours or annoy each other or whatever they were doing. Josh and West were arguing at the top of their voices, but keeping their distance. They had both been drinking heavily, using cannabis, and both had knives. Cannabis use, especially cannabis abuse, will increase your sense of paranoia. Paranoia is an irrational suspicion that someone is out to do harm to you. And again, therefore, we can think about how paranoid the group dynamic became when people are fighting with one another, when people are using violence to try and re-establish a sense of identity, a personal identity within a group dynamic. That paranoia is overladen in all the dynamics that we see that would lead to Josh losing his life. The argument alerted others on the street, and an off-duty police officer started recording the scuffle on his phone. What happened next would wreck a family, send shockwaves throughout the community, and cause massive controversy in court. No, I've never seen anything like that before, but it's common sense when somebody's on the floor and he's not moving, and there's no blood pumping out when you're trying to pump his heart, then, you know, it's not good news. I wish I was there. I would have just told him that how many people love him and that he's still loved. In October 2019, 18-year-old Josh Taylor from Hinckley, Leicestershire, was out drinking with his mates late into the night. One of the group, 17-year-old Dylan West, was known for sporadic violent outbursts. His mother had already said that she can't control him. He, he, he got, but like we, like we'd never seen that side of him. We'd never seen the angry side of him. After West had broken Josh's Bluetooth speaker, they briefly fought. Then West ran home and armed himself with two kitchen knives. Of course, friendships break down. Inevitably, over time, you fall out with your best friend. But your best friend is someone with whom you share more intense moments of joy and pleasure. It's the person you seek out to share an experience with. And of course, if that falls apart, this is also the person you want to do the greatest amount of damage to because you've opened up to them in the past. They know secrets that you might never have wanted to share with anyone else. And so don't ignore the intensity of the relationship that's going on here. And don't ignore the fact that when young men fall out with each other and try to regain a sense of face, they might resort in extreme circumstances to killing one another. As Josh and two other friends walked towards Dylan West's house, they met him coming the other way. Dylan and Josh were on opposite sides of the road shouting at each other. They'd already passed a taxi driver parked up waiting for his next fare. Now, they came back. They're all walking towards me again. And uh, one of the lads was walking one side of the road, the other lad was walking on the other side of the road. But as they were getting closer and closer to me, they were sort of veering in onto me. Josh and Dylan 
got closer and closer. I, I was just minding my own business there, sitting there, waiting for the phone. And then as they come towards me, I, it just come to my mind, I can't turn around. There's no, not enough room here to turn around. So I stayed there. And then all I've seen was one of the lads, his right fist come round and punched the other lad straight in the chest. So as they come in front of the car and as they veered into in front of the car and they stood there, one of the lads just turned round and got his fist out and he went like that straight into the other one's chest. And that's all I saw. A few doors down, an off-duty police officer had been recording the unruly teenagers on his mobile phone. So the police officer couldn't have realised what he was filming or about to film from his mobile phone. That was the moment that Dylan West stabbed Joshua in the heart. It was one single blow. At this point, Joshua said, what the fuck, bruv? Before he collapsed and fell to the floor. And Dylan West left his great mate bleeding to death in the road. What appeared to be an innocent punch to the chest turned out to be much more deadly. Hidden up West's sleeve was one of his kitchen knives. I did not see no knife, no nothing. And then the lad that got punched, he started struggling to walk past my minibus, my vehicle. And as I was looking at him through the driver's side mirror, I just turned around and started looking. It was walking and walking and walking. And as it was walking, you could see him going out of breath. And then all of a sudden, he just fell flat on his face behind the bus. West ran. Josh's other friends froze. I just drove 20 feet forward sort of thing, dialed 999. And as I was talking to the police, I just took a small drive around the block to go back to where it all happened. It, there was no other way off the estate anyway, you know, whichever way you go on that estate or off that estate, there's one way in, one way out. Another passing witness stopped their car and ran to help. By the time I got back to the scene again, there was a white mini parked on the opposite side of the road to where it happened. And there was a young lad and he was giving CPR to the lad on the floor. And uh, he was on the phone with the ambulance telling them what he was doing and all the rest of it. And I parked on the opposite side of the road as well where the white mini was as well. And I walked over to see what the extent of the damage was. All I seen was blood round his chest. Josh lay motionless. His heart had been punctured and he was bleeding to death. I realised when I seen the young lad giving him CPR, the mid 20 year old lad giving him the CPR, that's where I realised to myself something more serious than what I thought it was. Yeah, but again, because I didn't see no knife, no nothing. It didn't come to my mind how it happened. Josh Taylor died on that spot in Hinckley from a single stab wound that pierced his heart. Dylan West had disappeared. Police were on the scene quickly. Having identified the victim as Josh Taylor, their next task was to inform the family. The next minute I've got ding dong, ding dong at the door at two in the morning, telling me Josh is dead and I'm saying, you're lying because I was with him an hour ago. Two policemen just standing there t trying to say that Josh is dead. And I'm saying, no, you're lying, because I was only with him an hour ago. I'd only felt like I'd been asleep for about 10 minutes, you know. I was thinking, this can't be possible because I was with them. Lucy called Cameron. He sprinted round to Josh and Lucy's house to be confronted by a police officer. A police woman came up to me and said, do you know why he did this to him? So obviously we didn't know anything at this point, so I said, so you're telling me someone did this to him? And she said, I'm not allowed to tell you. I was like, well, you, you practically have. So I've come straight through the front door and I had to look everyone in their eyes and tell them that, something, that someone did this to Josh. And it, honestly, it was the hardest moment of my life, having to look his mum in the eyes and tell her that 
someone had murdered her son, and it was it was oh, it was horrible. I will never ever ever forget that moment. Like I'm tearing up now thinking about it because it hurts to this day because of uh, that was my that was my best friend that was my brother. Do you know what I mean? And I had to come and tell his family that what had happened to him, and it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And I felt like. I just wasn't a person anymore, you know? Like, I felt like a part of me had died, had gone, it was missing. And it was worse because I didn't know where Josh was. I didn't know where they'd taken him. You don't think anything's going to be ever that bad, you know? You don't... You, you know, you, you don't... You, even though you hear the words, you'd never believe it. You'd never believe it. I just still don't believe it now. Police were hunting for Dylan West. He'd run back to his home, seen and heard by many witnesses on his estate. He washed the knife. Um, I think his mum already knew about this as well. He washed the knife, didn't wash all the blood off, obviously. Um, went down his garden, jumped over his back fence, down the alleyway at the back, and someone was watching from their top window the whole time of him shoving it underneath a car. The police would recover that knife, and it took them only 10 minutes to find West back at his house where he was arrested. He denied murder and continued to deny it all the way to court. I've got a daughter to think of, so I can't, I can't leave her, because, you know, when her mum and dad are gone, when I'm gone and Tara's gone, she's not got a brother now to, to share that with, you know? That's all been stolen away from her, you know? It's ruined my daughter's life, it's destroyed us, it's destroyed our family, it's destroyed my mum and dad. I couldn't sit into that courtroom when he was on the stand because I couldn't trust myself from not getting up and strangling him to death or poking his eyes out, because that's what I would have done. In the early hours of Monday the 7th of October 2019, 18-year-old Josh Taylor from Hinckley near Leicester died of a single stab wound to the heart. Josh's killer was one of his best friends, 17-year-old Dylan West. Within minutes of the attack, he was arrested at home and charged with murder. The next morning, he appeared in court. I first saw Dylan West when he entered his plea at the Crown Court. The first impressions were he just looked like an ordinary young boy, really, and what on earth was he doing in this situation? It didn't make sense for someone who looked like a, an ordinary kid facing such a major charge because he was originally charged with murder and he pleaded not guilty to that. The trial date was set for March 2020. Josh's sister had the task of identifying her brother's body. Yeah, it was, uh, I'd say, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. All I wanted to do, really, was just hold his hand. And I couldn't even do that because second autopsy was on his hands, so we had to wear thick gloves. Um, it was a mess. It was disgusting. It made a mess of him big time. Yeah, it was uh, not nice to see, but I'm glad I did. No, Dad wants to see, see the son dead, doesn't he? Just knowing about it is, is bad enough, you know? Just, just knowing, and every day you wake up and it's there, every day you know he's gone, you know he's gone, and you, you just think, what's the point? What is the point anymore, you know? It's my, it was my purpose in life. You know, both of them are. And half of it's gone. And Lucy would have to bury her brother. Horrendous. Horrendous. It was horrible, especially because I had to do it all on my own as well, because my mum, she was in bits, so she couldn't deal with that. So it was like the flowers, the coffin, the, the service card, his clothes that he was wearing, everything was done by me, basically. The, the, where it was, where the wake was the burial, it was all done by me. Dylan West's murder trial was scheduled for March 2020. In the time that passed, Josh's family would have to cope as best they could. Sleepless, you know, emotions everywhere. It's crazy because like, I'm one of them people that's always like, oh, I like to do my hair and makeup, and ever since this has happened, I've not been like that. Dylan West's trial began on the 11th of March 2020 at Leicester Crown Court. So there was a 17-year-old boy in the dock at Leicester Crown Court behind a very thick pane of glass. 
which is completely separate from the rest of the court, fenced off if you like. And then his parents were in the public gallery. Joshua's family were there and it was just an air of terrible sadness and you knew that whatever the outcome, there definitely weren't going to be any winners. The prosecution were confident of gaining a conviction for murder, but Dylan West's defence would try their best to argue that this was all just a tragic accident. I couldn't sit into that courtroom when he was on the stand because I couldn't trust myself I'm not getting up and strangling him to death or poking his eyes out, because that's what I would have done. I wanted to kill him. I was going to kill him. West's defence team claimed that the tears in his coat were not caused by jumping off the roof of the petrol station that night, but that Josh had tried to stab him. He slipped and cut, uh, ripped his coat both sides at the back and on his cuffs and tried to say that my brother was trying to stab him in the back while running after him. Lies. They told the jury that Wes was in fear of his life and that he had come back out of his house to smoke a joint and chill out. But he'd armed himself with two kitchen knives and was seen by witnesses charging down his street, screaming at the top of his voice. For Dylan to say he was a scared man just taking um, some knives in order to protect himself if he was to encounter an enraged Josh, it didn't make sense. It didn't support the defence case when you could see him charging down the street, shouting his head off, shouting, come on, bonehead. He was challenging him to a fight. Nothing could have been clearer. The defence also claimed that Josh had run onto West's knife and the stabbing was in self-defence, a claim disputed by a key witness. Nobody ran to each other, no. They just walked normal walking, shouting whatever they were shouting to each other. And then when they got close to each other, all that happened was one punch. The way the lad punched his friend, it, it was meant to be. It was so hard that it was meant to be. It, I, I don't think it was an accidental punch because it was so hard that even me sitting in the vehicle, I felt it. Dylan said that Josh appeared from around the corner and ran at him. He claimed that Josh was armed and in fear of his safety, he had a fight or flight moment and he just hit out whilst holding the knife in his hand. He never raised that knife to Dylan. He never touched Dylan with that knife. I think he believes his own lies, I do. I think he believes that Josh ran into that knife and he didn't. I've seen it for myself, you know, he's, I don't know if he does believe his own lies or he's, he's tripping up on his lies or he's just trying to make more lies, but everything he said on that stand was not true. The jury were also told of Dylan West's actions after the killing. Why did you get another knife, two knives, Dylan? Why did you hide the knife after Dylan? Why did you wash the knife after Dylan? Why did you get changed after Dylan? It was all about that. And I feel like in court, none of that was relevant. The question for the jury to consider was whether or not West had intended to kill Josh. If he hadn't, then they could only convict him of manslaughter. So what did he intend? He was angry in the moment. This happened in the heat of the moment, in drink. It was something that should never have happened. These were two friends. It's an absolute tragedy. And... The jury must have found this a very difficult case indeed. They did, because on the 23rd of March 2020, they found West not guilty of murder and guilty only of manslaughter. The family were devastated. They were deeply distressed. They were looking for um, a conviction to murder. Um, but as far as the jury were concerned, the evidence didn't stack up. The Crown prosecutors were even shocked by the verdict. They were gobsmacked. They were absolutely gobsmacked. And they said, I don't know what they're looking at. I don't know what the jury's looking at. She says, I really don't know what they're looking at, but it's obviously not what we're seeing. Because, you know, he's guilty of murder. He was guilty of murder, not manslaughter. He's a murderer. He's a murderer. 
manslaughter means there wasn't a clear, deliberate intent to kill. But when you stick a knife into someone's chest, what is it that you are intending to do? Are you intending that they get up and go home afterwards? Well, Joshua never got up and he just died where he fell, more or less. For the manslaughter of Josh Taylor, West was sentenced to eight and a half years. When West was sentenced for the manslaughter of Josh, the judge said this was an insignificant falling out over a trivial incident. That seems to me to get things fundamentally wrong in trying to explain what happened here, because this clearly wasn't a trivial incident and nor was the falling out insignificant. In fact, it seems to me to have been filled with meaning. This is about two friends, they had known each other for two years, fundamentally falling out with one another. It was about power, about being in charge, who was dominant in this relationship. And therefore, this wasn't insignificant. This was filled with meaning. He did this, he, meaningful. It was meaningful. It was meaningful what he did. He meant to take my son that night. He meant to take his life that night. During their deliberations, one of the jury was sent home sick. The remaining 11 delivered their manslaughter verdict by a majority of 10 to one. The family don't believe that justice has been done. There are no winners. Two lives and two families have been devastated by this. One of them's no longer with us, and the other one is locked up. With good behaviour, Dylan West could be released from prison in four years. I can't forgive. He killed my best friend in cold blood. There is no way that I will ever forgive him. There is no way I will ever be able to look that guy in the, that got Dylan in the eye and ever, ever call him an acquaintance, a friend, anything. But he's, he meant it. There's 100% he meant it. There's no forgiveness. There never will be, not there. He's it's, it's my only son. He's my only son. And he's took him, he's took him away. Lucy tends her brother's grave every day. When I'm 40 years old, I'm always gonna look and see my brother as an 18 year old boy. And that scares me, growing up without him and one day I'm going to lose my mum and dad and having to go through that on my own, it really does scare me. And I know he wouldn't want that for me either. You know, I'm going to remember him as he was, as a kid, for the rest of my life. You know, I'm never going to hear his voice change. I'm never going to see him change. I'm never going to see him grow up to be a man. He's never going to give me grandkids, you know? I just miss him every day. I just miss him so much. It's horrible. The house feels dead without him. You know, it's, it's not nice at all. When I think about him, I just feel sorry for him that he had to go through that alone, because he didn't deserve that. <laughs>